Lovely saunterers, welcome to another saunter. We're looking at John chapter 5 today. So if you're just joining me for the first time, what we're doing is we're going through, we're looking at John's gospel. We're looking at Jesus through the eyes of his best friend, John. And John is uniquely placed to give us insights and stuff into Jesus. And, you know, from that really close perspective. And so we're going to pray. Lord, really help us today. Lord, we want to meet you as we look at this this passage of your word. We want it to be alive and real and not just a theoretical conversation. In Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Good morning, Kathy. So, chapter 5 then. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So we don't know particularly what feast it was. It might have been um, the Passover or something like that. But anyway, it was the Feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So it was obviously a big one that you're supposed to show up to. And verse 2, it says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Beth Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame and paralysed. Now, interestingly, good morning, Mark. Good morning, Fran. Interestingly, they've done excavations just um, on the outside of the temple area and they found precisely this pool and they found that it has got five colonnades or porches in the same way as John records it, which is really cool. I mean, it's not necessary for us to have like archaeological evidence but it's always fun when when it's found to be really accurate and corroborates the biblical account because there's so many people who want to try to discredit what the bible says and make it out to be a whole load of hocus pocus nonsense so that's really cool but anyway so here they are and jesus is there and there's this pool and it's surrounded by invalids blind lame and paralyzed and so one man there one man was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now, good morning, Chris and Ruth. Um, they're, they're, the accounts of different um, versions have a little bit in there, a little kind of editorial note to say that periodically an angel would come and stir up the waters people who got into the water in that sort of moment of it being stirred up were healed miraculously <clears throat> and so that would be why there's all these people there there's some question as to whether it was at particular kind of moments in the Jewish calendar that this phenomenon happened some people want to argue the toss and say well that's not God that's something else you know that's demonic or I just think God does amazing things and we should allow him to do that and we God is God we're not this was an angel um the or at least the the idea behind this was that there was an angel that would come stir up the waters they begin to move and the people who were sick who got in there quick quickly could be healed miraculously and so certainly this is this guy's expectation and it's the expectation of a whole load of people now either people are completely deceived there's a whole bunch of people brought into the same delusion and they just sit there and nothing ever happens or periodically something does happen and they keep coming back people keep coming back or they stay there like this guy hoping against hope that one day they'll be able to get into the water so the tragedy of this guy is that he's so disabled that he can't make it into the water and so he's been there for 36 years 38 years that's a long time of hope deferred isn't it the bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick that his heart must have been well and truly sick and so I don't know what keeps him there. Maybe it's just in the end he can't move or that's what he's become used to. Maybe he gets a living from begging um, or something like that. And so Jesus knows this story. He knows because God gives him revelation. He has this word of knowledge and he says, do you want to be healed? Now, this is a good question. It's not a silly question for somebody who's sick because actually, do you know what? 
back in the day and certainly in countries around the world, there are people whose disability earns them a living from begging. There are people who maybe have become used in our country to living on benefits and actually it's okay. It's not a it's not kind of a wealthy living, but at least they get by and they've learned to live with their their condition and have accepted it and maybe they might find themselves in that place of if they ran into someone who was offering to pray for them to be healed they might say don't worry about it it's fine I'm used to it I can live with it it's okay I've got what I need and so Jesus is asking this really legitimate question do you want to be healed and is the guy's soul so sick and so disillusioned that he's just I'm gonna ah I live here now I'll die here sort of kind of thing and the sick man answered sir I have no one to put me in into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going another steps down before me this is sad isn't it you can imagine the angels stirring the water quick 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 get in there's this feeding frenzy of all these people kind of slithering and crawling and stumbling into the water and this poor guy he can't do i don't know if he can mobilize himself at all um scuffing along on his hands and dragging himself in he just can't do it bless him what a tragedy and jesus can feel it jesus has got that he knows what's going on here and he says while i'm going another steps in before me and jesus said to him get up Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, took up his bed and walked. Now me, I cannot believe, I, this is just the most incredible story. I was going to, I just can't believe the, inc- it's not like I can't believe the story, but I just can't believe this kind of, what must have been going on inside this guy's heart and mind as Jesus says these things to him. Is he thinking you <laughs> got to be kidding me i have not walked for 38 years how can i pick up my bed and walk that is the most stupid thing i've heard all day he doesn't say that and i i would love to know what at what point the miracle happens is it when jesus speaks it he literally feels something does he feel healed does he suddenly think wow or does he just have this incredible surge of faith come into his heart and mind that without thinking he jumps up and picks up his mat it's just mind-boggling it's utterly mind-boggling and wouldn't you have loved to have been there to see it i would so have loved that and but jesus is walking in such profound authority good morning admire at such in such profound authority with such unbelievable clarity and in um knowledge of who he is good morning pat and mike it's not he he just is able to deliver this this miracle in one go so like we were saying yesterday jesus doesn't pray for him he just says pick up your bed go on get up pick up your bed and walk and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked at once at once oh come on jesus increase my faith do it on me lord make give me that gift of faith ah yeah (laughs) jesus come on let it soak into me hallelujah amen right so now the day was the sabbath so the jews said to the man who had been healed it is the Sabbath and it's not law for you to take lawful for you to take up your bed. This is just nuts, isn't it? Instead of being like, whoa, this is the guy who was crippled or disabled. We have to you know, use the right words. He was disabled for 38 years and he's walking instead of being able to be like, whoa, that's amazing. That's the most incredible thing I've seen in my whole entire life. They're saying, man, don't you know that this is a Sabbath? You're carrying your bed. That's a violation of the Sabbath. Apparently, the rabbis had got so finicky finicky about the, these rules that they they said that even a person who carries a needle in their robe on the Sabbath is working so this is not going well so these so jesus's opponents rather than being 
wow, this is the most incredible thing we've ever seen. They're saying, this is breaking the Sabbath. This guy is is a lawbreaker. And good morning, Mary Jane and Andrew. Lovely to see you. <laughs> so he says, it's the Sabbath and not lawful for you to take up your bed. Verse 11, but he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk it's like i'm blame shifting i i was i was just lying here kind of like stuck for 38 years and this guy says pick up your bed and walk and do you know what to be honest it didn't even occur to me it was the sabbath i don't suppose it did and they asked him who is the man who said to you take up your bed and walk now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place you can imagine there was and there would have been a huge hubbub of everyone looking at this guy and like whoa whoa what what just happened what did i miss what did i miss everyone talking among themselves the critics getting louder and louder and jesus sort of just took the opportunity to sneak off jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place verse 14 afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, <laughs> sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Isn't this amazing? This whole thing just boggles my mind. There's this guy, he's healed and Jesus sees him and says, oh, see, you're well. It's like, yay. And uh, but then he says, sin no more. And it's, it's interesting that he Jesus is linking sin with the origin of sickness now we don't know that this guy there's another place where jesus tells his disciples no it's not because this man sinned or his parents that he's sick but at the same time there definitely is a correlation between sin and sickness and sickness is in the world because of sin because adam and eve sinned because mankind sinned sickness came in on the back of all of that and so jesus is saying you it's not just your physical healing i'm concerned about it's actually your spiritual regeneration your spiritual life and he said i'm giving you not just a new chance to run about and become an athlete or high jumper or whatever no this is the moment now where i want you to repent of your old way of life and become a disciple of me and follow me sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you so there are are things worse than being disabled all our lives like missing jesus's offer of salvation and finding that we've entered into eternity without him that is worse and so jesus is saying you make some choices bro so that nothing worse may happen to you the man went away and told the jews that it was jesus who'd healed him and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. And so whilst we understand and we were talking about yesterday, I think we come into God's rest and enjoyment of our sonship or daughtership of the the god who truly loves us before we do anything before we get out of bed in the morning he loves us he is just devoted he's passionately devoted to us in that that sense his love is poured out he has lavished his affection on us at the same time we're in we're in the family business and jesus said listen i'm in the family business my father is working and i am working my father is working until now now we understand from the creation story that on the sixth day oh sorry on the seventh day god rested he he did all his work in six days and he rested on the seventh and there we understand about the sabbath but jesus is making it clear listen because he rested from creation on the seventh he didn't just stop doing everything and then it's all just kind of happening he sustains it all and he watches over it and he's moving in the affairs of men and women and god is moving from the very beginning till now he is working he's busy and i too am working and so there's an understanding there jesus is saying like uh, yeah 
I'm in the place of rest. We, we, we understand there's a whole load of truth in this, that Jesus is like the Lord of the Sabbath. He is living in rest. He knows exactly who he is. He's not trying to prove anything. But at the same time, the Father is working and he's working and there's, biz- there's work to be done. There's business to be carried on. And so he's really kind of identifying a massive flaw in their understanding about the Sabbath. But of course, the Jews can't really hear that. But then verse 16, sorry, 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Listen, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, This has been a huge controversy way back in history, around about 320 AD. There was this huge controversy about whether Jesus, whether the Son and the Father are of the same substance, whether they're alike completely. And there is a distinction between the Father and the Son that Jesus makes and the Bible makes. And... There in, and we're going to hear a bit more about it in a minute. But this controversy was very strong and very powerful. And it still kind of lingers on in some circles today. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, do not believe that Jesus and the Father are of the same substance. So they, they don't, they kind of downgrade Jesus from being God to just being the son of God in a very high status. But um, John the Apostle is quite clear, and I think he's really trying to make a point. He said it right in the beginning in his prologue, prologue. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So he's very emphatic that the Logos, Jesus the Logos, is God. But here he's saying these Pharisees understood what Jesus was doing with his language. He was claiming God is his father and therefore making himself equal with God. He was saying, um, uh, you know, this this my father in a very particular kind of way, um, which kind of puts him on the same level as God. I think we've got this incredible little um parable going on with jesus uh you know growing up in his father's workshop and learning how to the father joseph's workshop learning how to be a carpenter doing what he sees the father doing and you know my father is working and i am working jesus is jesus is like this is my relationship with god the father i do what i see him doing i'm jumping the gun a little bit but also, we've got this incredible, profound truth that that John really wants us to get, that the Jews understood what Jesus was saying. He was making himself equal with God. And this is a quite important theme to John, and he wants to kind of labour that point so we understand. Right, here we go. We're going to go into a bit of theology. All of this is theology. It's pretty profound, pretty important. So Jesus said to him, to, to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he's doing and greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. Right. Hold that thought. Right. So Jesus is saying, I don't act independently of my father, but actually I'm mirroring him. Basically, what he's doing is what I'm doing. I'm. Oh, so I I love that. So Jesus said somewhere else, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And so when Jesus loved people and healed them, he was acting out the heart of the father to the to the human race. And when Jesus picked up the children and blessed them, that that's the heart of the father being demonstrated so jesus is saying listen everything i'm doing is what the father's doing already in in a sense the father is doing it through jesus but jesus is doing it as god himself but he's not acting independently and he's it's like he's saying there's this relationship the father reveals things to me to get on with and i wonder 
how it worked, whether Jesus got like a list of miracles he was going to do that day, he just received them in his heart, or when he got into the situation, he knew that there was some miracles to be done, and the father was like, yep, this one, uh, or I don't know, on what kind of level that communication happened, I'm sure it varied. Anyway, so listen to this then. So the father's going to show greater works than these the ones that you've seen so that you're going to marvel so i'm going to still do greater stuff so jesus is giving them a little um trailer of some of the upcoming events in his ministry and they're going to be even greater than what they've seen already which is cool because it's pretty great so far i'm going to say so verse 21 as the father raises the dead and gives them life so also the son gives life to whom he will wow so they understood, the Jews understood that God himself could raise people from the dead. And they had it in their Old Testament scriptures or the scriptures that they had in their hands, which were our Old Testament. They had evidences of God raising the dead with Elijah and Elisha and others. Um, and he says, for as the father raises the dead and gives gives them life. So also the son gives life to those he will, to whom he will. So the son has executive power to choose who he gives life to. That's amazing, isn't it? And we know Jesus went on to raise Lazarus from the dead and the widow's son at Nain and so on. But also Jesus gives eternal life to those who surrender their hearts to him, who bring their lives to him and offer them up to him. He gives them eternal life. Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in him has eternal life, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this is really important. The son has this executive power to give life just as the father does. Good morning, Zoe. Good morning, Sam. So just as the father raises the dead, and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Now that's an interesting one, because I think some people have this kind of weird thinking that God is austere and grand and judgy and scary and terrifying, but Jesus is kind of nice and fluffy and cosy like a koala bear. And actually, Jesus is saying, listen, listen to me. The father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. That all may honour the son just as they honour the father. And he's, and I think this is pretty awesome. Good morning, Helen. The son, the father is giving the judgment to the son. So Jesus is the one who judges. He just said in a previous chapter that he didn't come to condemn the world. The son didn't come to condemn the world. Um, and so we've got this sense that somehow Jesus is judging the world, but his heart is not to condemn it. His heart is to save it. It's really important we understand these things because we can get this horrid, nasty caricature of God where we end up distorting his image and we, we start believing a complete pack of lies. God the Father is all loving, just as Jesus is all loving. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's quick to forgive however he does not leave the guilty unpunished it's, it's so and here comes the son who is now coming to lay down his life for the whole world he's going to make this unbelievably extreme sacrifice for a bunch of people who have turned their backs on god and this son who is prepared to do this act of sacrifice is the one to whom the father is entrusted judgment who else <laughs> seriously listen to me who else could we rely on to give a more just and true judgment than the one who's willing to lay down his life for us all he's prepared to pay the ultimate price to save us from condemnation to save us from spending eternity away from god lost without trace this is the judge of all the earth this is the one who will that the father is entrusted judgment to 
He's given all judgment to the son that all may honour the son just as they honour the father. And this again hits at this controversy about the deity, the godness of Jesus. He says that all may honour the son just as they honour the father. Well, if the son is less than the father, then they would honour him slightly less than the father. But actually, if the son and the father are equally God then they are worthy of equal honour. And so this is precisely what Jesus is saying. This is this would have been a red rag to the bull to the Pharisees and the Jews who he was talking to. He's saying that all may honour the Son. All, all, as everybody, all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. In just exactly the same way. So giving him the same degree of honour is an awesome thing so whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him truly truly i say to you whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life so even now you're listening and you're receiving the word of god through me paul white today and you're saying do you know what i receive that i believe that jesus i believe you I believe you are the son of God. I believe you, you know, I believe these things about you. Truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So even now, God has entrusted this message to human beings to transmit it, to give it out to each other. And if we believe and receive Jesus, we believe we're receiving the one who sent him, who is the father. And there is this gift of eternal life that he gives us. So truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. There is a choice about receiving Jesus. It just doesn't just happen automatically. We have to make that choice to say in our hearts, Jesus, I choose to believe you. I choose to receive you. I choose to believe the one who sent you. Give me that gift of eternal life. Let me escape the judgment that is coming on the world. Let me be saved from whatever it is you came to save me from. If you wanted to save me enough to die for me, whatever you were trying to save me from, save me from it. Let me be saved. Truly, truly. So he says, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, I'm going to stop there because it doesn't get any less dense. And so we're going to or in, intense. We're going to look at the rest tomorrow of this chapter. But listen to me, if you're on that point of making that decision of whether to receive Jesus or not, please do not delay it. Do it today. Do it while there's breath in your body and how much faith do we need to be saved? I think we just have, a, have to have enough faith to call out to God and say it out loud. Say, Jesus, I believe. I give you. I entrust my life into your hands. I entrust my future, my forever and ever into your hands. Let your death on the cross cleanse me from all of my sin, past, present and future. And take me as your child today. Amen. <laughs> Have a stunning day, you guys. Lots of love.